you know, sometimes we have to know when it's a good thing and to cut in so that we can get started with the conversation that we're supposed to have. Uh, but it is wonderful to see everybody who is on. Uh, if I have not had the chance to meet you, which I hope that I will soon in person, but if I haven't, I am Faith Gibson Hubbard, and I am honored to serve as the senior advisor for PAVE. Uh, and I'm also a parent. I live in Ward 5, and I have two children who, at the moment, both attend school within school. But next year, my son will be at Washington Latin. And we found that out recently because of the My School DC lottery. And so we are here today um, to talk about um, My School DC. We have come a really, really long way because I remember over 10 years ago, being pregnant with my son, uh, running around uh, Ward 5, trying to make sure that people were going to know that we were having a lottery system that was going to open. You no longer had to sleep outside of the school there where you wanted to apply or think about the 25 different dates that you might need to have on your calendar in order to um, think about when this school was going to have a lottery, when that school was going to have a lottery, when you also need to enroll at your neighborhood school. It was a lot of chaos. Uh, and while we may not have a perfect system, we do have a system that is really the envy of a lot of other spaces, um, that we are working more and more towards equity. And we know that um, each of our paid parent leaders who are on here today will continue to push for that. And so while I'm sure that you have all had the experience of uh, now knowing what the My School DC lottery is, um, either you've been through the lottery with your children or maybe you will in the future, um, we always need to continue to have a conversation to check on the investments that are supposed to be serving us as parents and as a city well. And so I'm excited to have both Megan uh, on, uh, who leads the work of My School DC, and also Chelsea, who happens to be a neighbor, a War 5 neighbor of mine, and that I've known for a long time, who is doing a phenomenal job in just outreach and engagement and partnerships in the My School DC space. Um, so um, we're really excited to have everybody on. Please, please, please uh, put your name, uh, ward, and where your children go to school uh, in the chat. And if your children are in college, which I see a couple people on your kids in college, shout that out too, because that is quite the feat that many of us are trying to get to uh, someday. It feels far in the distance for me, but I'm sure one day my children will leave home. Uh, but with that introduction, I want to go ahead and toss things over to both Megan uh, and to Chelsea. Uh, probably to you first, Megan. I know you're, you know, you're no longer new. Uh, and shiny, uh, but we are excited that you are still here um, with us in the district doing this great work. But I can turn over to you to bring some greetings and then over um, to Chelsea. But please, please, please make sure to put your name, your ward, uh, and also where your children go to school in the chat. And if you have questions as we go along, please feel free to drop them in the chat and I will be keeping track of them uh, to share with both Megan and Chelsea. Over to you guys. Thank you, Faith. And actually, I'm going to quickly go over our agenda, and then I will hand it over to Megan to introduce herself. We were thrilled to have her be able to join us today as our still new-ish, I'm still talking about her as new executive director here at my school, DC. Three months in. I'm, I'm like yeah. old hat now. <laughs> Okay. Um, you're a pro now. You're a pro. You're with it. <laughs> that's right. she, she's made it through all the deadlines and results today. I feel like that's the trial by fire. She, she's ready to go. Um, awesome. So we're going to do some brief welcome and introductions, uh, talk about my school DC stuff, let uh, Megan introduce herself, as well as talk a little bit about our pack, including Yolanda, who's on here as well. Uh, and then I'll give everyone a brief lottery overview and run through a lot of our events and helpful resources just so you're aware of everything My School DC has available for parents and families as they're navigating um, the lottery. And then as Faith mentioned, if you have questions, please do pop those in the chat along the way um, or raise your hand if you'd prefer to come off mute to ask those questions. Um, we'll, we'll pause for questions after each section, but also have time at the end to answer any lingering questions that might still um, arise. So with that, um, you are already ahead of the game here with the name in Ward and the schools. I was going to have folks also add in on a scale from one to 10, how familiar they felt with the lottery as well, just to get a kind of temperature for the room as we're talking about things, whether this is going to be, you know, a review for you all or whether there are still things you're looking to learn. Um, so definitely if you haven't introduced yourself yet, pop that in there as well. If you're feeling not at all familiar at a one, or if you're feeling expert level, you should join our team or the pack uh, at a level 10. All right, and now with that, I will hand it over to Megan to introduce herself, our fabulous new executive director. 
Oh, thanks, Chelsea, and thanks, Faith. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you all. As you've heard, I am new, relatively new to my school, DC, um, in joining its um, as its new leader, but I am very familiar with the lottery program um, because I really wanted to share it. It's really exciting to talk to this group because I come from the orientation of being a parent advocate. I mean, that's really how I've spent um, my career. Um, I am an attorney. I had worked as a special education um, attorney and parent advocate um, for children with disabilities. And that's how I started out my career and worked many, many years in legal aid settings, particularly helping parents that did not have the resources to otherwise be able you know, to afford attorney representation and trying to secure the appropriate services um, and supports for their children in school. And from there, um, I you know, worked with children in the child welfare system um, and represented them for many years um, who ha you know, have a much higher propensity of having disabilities and unfortunately undiagnosed and unaddressed um, disabilities within our school system and, um, and did some reform work there and, um, and started working with Chelsea. I had the benefit of really knowing the staff um, very well as working with them um, as one of their partners, as one of their agency partners and bringing, you know, I know how important the lottery is. So I was one who was bringing um, these kind of tra trainings and presentations to my organizations, both at nonprofits that worked with families as well as um, city agencies that are providing services to families. And, um, you know, in closing, I mean, everything that Faith was saying about remembering way back when, I think really resonates with me. I think part of what made me so excited about joining this team is I have personally seen how important um, this lottery and sort of having a unified um, system in place for parents to be able to express their school choices uh, because I remember what it was like. I, I, I was doing that. I was working with families <laughs> before we had that lottery and Faith's right. I mean, it was, it was a whole different, uh, different story back then of, uh, you know, parents having a lot more to, uh, you know, have to keep track of, of like all the different application deadlines for different charter schools and all the different rules and ways different schools operated. So I think that's a lot of what we're trying to do uh, and what the lottery has done over the years is to try to make this process of expressing your choices uh, for your children, since you know your children best, um, to make that easier for you. So uh, thank you for having us. Um, you know, I, I think Chelsea hopefully will share. I know it looks like we've got a range of experience in the room, but um, but hopefully our, our goal is that you learn something new today or it reinforces what you know so you can help us in spreading, you know, word about the lottery to other people. Great. Thank you, Megan. And yeah, I see lots of tens in there. I would put myself at like a nine. I feel like I'm always still learning something and also punting things over to our incredible hotline more often than not when there are some of those harder questions. Um, so you got to meet Megan um, and myself, but I also want to make sure you're aware of who our other team members are. So we have an incredible team of eight here at My School DC, um, including Kelly Brown, who's our school success manager, and Alex Capel, who is our director of operations and analysis. I'm, of course, our director of partnerships and engagement. And then we have a four-person full-time hotline team who is absolutely incredible. Um, three of the four have been here essentially from the infancy of the lottery. So they have heard it all and they have seen it all. Um, and if you have not utilized them as a resource yet or shared them as a resource to other families, please know that they're incredible and available um, if and when you need them or have any questions about the lottery itself. We also have an incredible parent advisory council um, and Yolanda is one of our members. So we have representatives from every ward uh, in the city and they provide input on the design implementation of policies, programming, new initiatives, et cetera. They're also key ambassadors for us in the community. So we heavily rely on our parent advisory council members to ensure that the community members in their ward are aware of all the key dates and deadlines, upcoming events, key information, et cetera. Um, so you'll see our PAC members in the community, tabling at events, at Lottery 101 sessions with me. Um, so they are an incredible group um, and comprised of volunteers. And we will be recruiting. I am still waiting for our final survey results from our current PAC members, but I know we'll be recruiting um, for next year in a number of wards. So definitely keep an eye out for that. And I'll make sure to share that with Faith um, when that call out um, is available as well. But shout out to Yolanda. And we love you too. Thanks for the shout out. <laughs> um, great. Well, 
I did see a lot of 10. So it seems like this is probably more than likely going to be a review for you all. But as Megan mentioned, the more people that are knowledgeable about the lottery, the easier our jobs are because it means more of you are out there in the community ensuring people have the information that they need um, as they're navigating the lottery for the first time. Um, quick overview about who we are, what we do. Um, we are the common application and public school lottery for all DC public schools and most of the public charter schools that serve pre-K three to grade 12 here in the district, as you've heard from Faith and Megan before we came into existence now 11 years ago, there were different policies, rules, uh, deadlines for all the LEAs or local education agencies citywide. So we, we came into existence to really simplify um, and make more equitable this process for DC families. Um, our application is online only, and it is random. It is not first come, first serve, as long as, long as you're applying by those deadlines. Um, and families can apply up to 12 schools citywide. We do also have, as I mentioned earlier, our hotline that's available. So if families have any um, technology concerns or issues with that online application, they can actually call our hotline to complete that application over the phone. Um, and we also have a ton of amazing partners citywide who have been trained on the lottery application and can help support their families in case families do not have access to internet. So we are at the tail end of our 2024-2025 school year lottery cycle. Um, two big important dates still remain, including enrollment Saturday, which is coming up this Saturday, um, where we have more than 200 schools that will be open to take um, enrollment paperwork and help those who have been matched enroll or those who are currently at the school re-enroll for next school year. Um, so please, if you haven't yet, please spread the word about that event happening on Saturday. And then the last and final big deadline is May 1st, which is our enrollment deadline for matched families. This is incredibly important because if you are matched in the lottery and you do not enroll by that May 1st deadline, schools can then decline your offer and start making offers off their wait list. So please also help us spread the word about that enrollment deadline. Make sure that families um, are getting enrolled if they want to be enrolled at their match school. Um, and we are hoping to have lottery dates for next cycle out usually around late August, early September is when we release those dates. Um, so those will be available for you as well. And just a little more information about enrollment Saturday here and those two important reminders that uh, students who are matched in the lottery must enroll by May 1st. Um, and a reminder that enrolling at that match school will not remove them off of the wait list of the schools they ranked above where they're matched. Um, so please do help us spread the word. This is the website here. And I'll actually share with Faith as well. We have a whole partner toolkit. So if you um, want to get the word out on social media, we'd love your help doing so uh, before Saturday's big day. We are also now in what is referred to as the post-lottery application. So if you know any families that are interested in a public school for next school year and missed the deadlines, they can still apply for a school for next year. Um, so that post-lottery application is available for anyone who missed the application deadlines or anyone who wants to add additional schools to their application. Um, once you get past those deadlines, it does become first come first serve. So if you have families that are interested in applying, please do let them know the sooner they do that, the better. And they will be placed um, on wait lists or receive a match uh, after anyone who applied in the lottery within their preference category. We will also have um, one of our resources that does become available usually like the first week in May, right after that deadline um, for enrollment is our short wait list page. So that'll be a page that's available of all the schools that have 10 or fewer uh, waitlist posi positions um, for a specific grade at a specific school. So that will be coming out in May. Um, keep an eye out for our alerts. And I know Faith receives those as well. So that will be available. Um, so that's especially important for anyone who might be waitlisted at all their school options or who might have missed those deadlines and is applying in that post lottery application. So quick overview of who needs to apply. Um, applications are required if you are a new student in any pre-K-3 or pre-K-4 program, and that includes at your in-boundary school. And a reminder of that age cutoff is September 30th. So um, if you know a family that has a student turning three by September 30th of 2024, they are eligible for pre-K-3 next school year and hopefully already applied. And if not, um, let them know that they can apply in the post-lottery application right now. Um, if you are going to have a new student any dual language strand at a DCPS in boundary elementary school, any DCPS out of boundary citywide or selective school, and any public charter school, if they're going to be a new student at that school, an application is required. 
So who does not need to apply? Our application is not required if a student wants to attend their in boundary school in K through 12. Um, K through 12 are compulsory grades here in the district. So you have a guaranteed seat at your in boundary school in those grades. Um, similarly, if a student is attending a school and wants to attend a feeder pattern school, either DCPS or PCS, uh, they do not need to apply through the application. They can simply enroll at that feeder pattern school. And then if a student wants to stay at their current school, again, they do not need to reapply. We get that question a lot, pre-K-3 to pre-K-4, whether folks need to reapply for that grade since it's a non-compulsory grade. If they are already enrolled at that school, they do not need to reapply through the lottery. They can simply re-enroll at the school. Um, if families are not aware of their in-boundary school, they can use our school finder. They can in input their address, toggle on see in-boundary only, and it'll pop up with their in-boundary elementary, middle, and high school options so that they know which schools um, they have that by right seat for. So quick overview of lottery preferences. Um, Schools offer a variety of preferences and students who qualify for a preference will have a match at that school or a better waitlist placement at that school than students who are not eligible for that preference. So some examples include sibling offered, sibling attending, equitable access, which we'll dive into a little uh, in the slides that we have next, as well as transfer preference. And those are available at DCPS and PCS schools. Um, some preferences that are only offered by DCPS schools include that in-boundary preference. And again, that's pre-K only because you have a guaranteed seat in your in-boundary school in K through 12. Proximity preference um, in pre-K to grade five. And that's a very specific preference. If you are further than a half mile from your in-boundary school and closer than a half mile to your proximity school, then it would pop up um, as a preference for you in the system. And then there are some select DCPS schools that are considered early action uh, pre-K. That's a list we receive from DCPS each year. So if you apply in the lottery, again, by that deadline and include your early action pre-K school, you essentially have, you have a guaranteed seat at that school. Um, that is not the case now that we're in the post-lottery application. So if, if a family is looking at an early action pre-K, they do not have that guaranteed seat necessarily at that school because the lottery deadlines have passed. Um, and then some select PCS schools offer children of staff preferences, uh, military preference at Learn PCS, and special education preference at Bridges PCS. Um, one thing to note is the definition of sibling may vary by school. So definitely check in with your school if you have any questions about that. And the DCF, uh, DCPS selective high schools do not offer sibling preference. So that's also something to be aware of when thinking about preferences. So I wanted to dive a little more deeply into the equitable access preference since we are still, it's, a, it's a still a very new preference. We're now in our third year outside of the pilot program, uh, but this preference is designed specifically for those who have been identified as at risk. So any students who are experiencing homelessness in the foster care system, um, who qualify for TANF or SNAP, or high school students who are one year or older than the expected age for the grade they are entering, they would be eligible for this preference. Um, we have a one pager on our site. Um, that has kind of a basic overview of who qualifies and how it works, but it's very straightforward. If you are applying to any school that offers the Equal Access Preference, there is a checkbox at the end of the application that you simply check. No paperwork is required. There's nothing we need. We just need um, a check from you to say that we can see if you qualify for, um, for that preference. And the database will do that for us. So it will identify you through the lottery itself. Um, for this upcoming school year, we have 16 LEAs and 52 schools who are participating in the equitable access preference, either with a designated seat or a true lottery preference. So this is next year's LEAs, and we have an entire page um, with the full list of equitable access schools that's available as well. So I'll make sure this deck gets to you so you can link out to that if that's of interest. And we are anticipating these networks to continue to grow. So um, we will have, I believe the deadline is in July or August when new schools and LEAs opt in to the Xboxes preference. So we should have updated information when our, when our website refreshes in November of 2024. And I see we have something in the chat. Whoop doo doo. Experience will not be a slot. Yeah, it looks like Chelsea, just a question about how um, if you don't get your first match, um, what might be some advice for parents that are then having to navigate the process of seeking the next best thing? Can we add, can we wait until the end, Carolyn? I, sure. see your, I just want to make sure that we can get through because some questions may be at, answered as we go through Great. and then we'll do the second half for that. Because mm -hmm. Thanks. Dave. Perfect. We can do that. Great. So Carolyn, I see your hand and I'll make sure that we come to you after Sharice's question. Great. 
Perfect. Thank you both. Um, great. So I just wanted to tackle why it's so important to rank in the order you like most. Our algorithm is designed to try to match you at the school you like most if it can. So it um, it starts at the top of your list and goes down. You can only be matched with up to one school and you will only be waitlisted at the schools you ranked above where you're matched. Again, because the algorithm assumes you are ranking those schools in the order you like most. So please, 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 if you're working with families or if you're doing an application yourself, please make sure you're actually ranking those schools in the order you actually like most um, so the algorithm can work the way it's supposed to. Um, so just a quick example of what this might look like. This family applied to six schools that they were interested in. They're matched at their number two school. Um, and are waitlisted at the number six position with an inbound re preference at their number one school choice. They are not on the waitlist for the schools they ranked below where they're matched. Again, because the algorithm assumes number three through six is not as preferred for this family as their number two choice was where they've already been matched. Um, so this is why it's so incredibly important that families are actually ranking as we're um, telling them to, because we want to make sure that the algorithm is, can actually work in your favor. Um, I know the hotline gets a lot of calls. People get very sad that they're matched with their number one school and have coming off the wait list for the other schools, but that's because the algorithm's done what it's designed to do. So please, when you're working with families, um, make sure that they're ranking those schools in the order like most. Enrolling your child at their matched school, as I mentioned earlier, will not remove them from the wait list. So if this family wants to enroll at their matched school, they can do so and they will remain on that wait list for their number one choice they can come off that wait list before the deadline and before school starts or after school starts. We see a lot of movement in particular between that May 1st enrollment deadline and October 5th, which is count day here in the district. So there's a lot of wait list movement that can happen between um, those few months uh, before and after the start of school as well. So if you are waitlisted at all of your options, um, you can of course log into your account and see your position on wait lists in real time. Um, you can add additional schools to your application. As I mentioned, now that we're in the post ladder, you can add additional schools um, to your application if there are other schools you were interested in and maybe just didn't add them um, in the initial application. Now's a great time to add those additional schools. And as I mentioned as well, we have that short wait list um, page coming out soon. So you might take a look at that and see if there's schools on that list that were of interest to you that might make more sense or see more movement um, before the start of the school year. In K through 12, you can of course enroll at your in boundary school. You have a guaranteed seat at that school. And then if you have any families or if you yourself have pre-K three or pre-K four students, the district also has PK program. Um, so there are community-based options that offer free pre-K here in the district. Um, we have a full page dedicated to those school options outside of My School DC. Again, that's not through our application, um, but we do link out to their contact information. So please reach out um, to those individual programs if that's of interest or if there's any that are nearby um, your home that you might be interested in those as well. So key takeaways. The lottery is random. It is not first come, first serve. Um, all the matches are based on the number of available seats at each grade at each school. The lottery preference that an applicant is eligible for, so uh, equitable access, a sibling offered, et cetera, um, and your random lottery number. And then, of course, the things you can control in this process are the schools you select to apply to, the order in which you rank those schools, making sure you're ranking those in the order you actually like most, and applying by the deadline. Um, we always encourage families, even if they're just considering a new uh, public school option for the following school year, that they apply by the deadline for their best chance at being matched. And you can decide by May 1st if you want to actually enroll at that school or not. Faith, do you want me to pause here for those initial questions or do you want me to dive into resources and then circle back to questions yeah, at the I'm end? Pause for the questions. And I think Great. both of them, it seems like they put in the chat. So the first one Great. is... Uh, from Sharice. She said, thank you for this session. I can vividly recall as a parent the experience of not getting a slot in the desired school of my choice. In terms of recovery uh, to choose the next best option, will you give insights on how parents can work within the My School DC Lottery space to recover by, and I like that word recover because it is hard. It's a, it's a lot of anxiety around the process. So I just want to say that to as a parent who's been through it. Um, First, navigating the waitlist space, and two, how to identify the next best option for a student, and what are some guiding points you can offer us? And then I'll come to the next question. Great. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, you can log in and see your waitlist movement happening in real time. 
that can go both directions. So I do like to give parents a, head up, a heads up that that is the case. So if you have you know, a sibling offer preference that comes in at this school year on the wait list for, your position could move in the opposite direction that you would like it to go. Um, so I definitely understand that that can be nerve wracking to see that movement happening. Um, but you can at least see it happening in real time. And as I mentioned, between May and October, there is pretty significant waitlist movement that happens. Um, I'll share it in our resources later, but you can see at least historically the waitlist movement that's happened at the school that you're looking at in particular um, in our tableau. We, we do share out that data every year. Um, so you can see kind of historically how many seats have been made, how many matches have been made, and how that waitlist movement has happened in the past to get a sense of what that might look like for you um, for the upcoming school year. Um, and you'll remain on those wait lists even if you're enrolling at that school. So there, there's still a, a chance you can be matched ultimately or receive an offer rather um, from those schools you ranked above uh, where you're matched. As I mentioned, you can also add additional schools to your application. Um, and then I know this is something that came up in a PAC meeting that I thought was a, a brilliant suggestion. And I, um, where you are, are matched, they suggested like, reaching out to the school themselves and seeing if you can get a tour or an open house, reaching out to parents that are at that school. Um, a lot of schools are really excellent options. And I think getting to know the school where you were matched, there was a reason you put that on your application to begin with, that you considered it a school you would be willing to send your child to. So getting a better sense of the school, feeling more com comfortable and confident if that is where your child will end up for the following school year. Um, so I thought that was a really great suggestion from one of our PAC members as well. Um, well, I'll go to the next question, but I just want to say, I do think it, you, you do have to be very discerning when you are putting schools on your list, because I have heard uh, in previous roles that I served in that parents do put schools there because they're trying to maximize the amount of slots. And sometimes it's not a school that they actually want to send their children to. So maybe after we get through these next couple of questions, you could talk about <laughs> those resources and how to make you know, good choices. Cause some people are like, well, I don't want my kid to go there. And I'm like, well, why did you ever put it there? <laughs> why was it on your application? But, but there, again, know. there's a lot of anxiety around this process. And I just want to, there's a lot because other cities don't have to do this. Um, and some of us grew up in places where we didn't have to do this. So um, the next question is from Carolyn and then I will come to Tiara and Anna. I see both of your hands. So Carolyn had her hand up and this was her question, equitable access and other priority um, slash preferences. Can you remind me where that fits in the order of various preferences? I know inbound is first. Once those are full, it is equitable access next in preference, or is it out of boundary, out of bounds sibling? Maybe so that, it, yeah, this is, yeah. Our, but you probably know what you need to say. Okay. Yeah. So this actually varies by school and, and by LEA. So I, I'll show you, um, a sample of our school profiles, but if you visit, we have school profiles for every participating school in the lottery and every school profile. So if you're looking at a particular school, you can actually see the all of the preferences that they offer and the order in which they're applied. So now across the board on every school profile, the order that is listed is actually the order in which those um, preferences are applied, which is new as of a few years ago. So we do have that information on every school profile. So you can see, cause it does vary. Um, and depending on how the school offers equitable access, whether it's a designated seat or a true preference, um, you would see that listed on the preferences only if it's a true preference. Um, as opposed to a designated seat. And Thank you, that is helpful. That. Do you know, and I can, I'll go check, that's good. I'll direct, someone asked me this question yesterday, which is why I was curious, I wanna make sure I gave the right answer. When you say LEAs, is all of DCPS the same yes. or are different DCPS yep. schools different? So like the charters have different ones, but for one, so, DC, once I figure that out, then that's all yeah, the same so for all the different DCPS. DCPS is all the same. However, they do have, I guess it's technically not the same because there are only some that offer equitable access for their in-boundary pre-Ks. So that would, that's new as of this year. But in general, across the board, the order is essentially okay, But the either same. way, it's good to know if they go to the page and it's the page from my school DC for the school, that's the Correct. one you're referring to? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. We have well, um, our participating schools page. You can link out from there. Or if you're using our school, prof um, school finder, you can also search for schools there and it'll, it'll take you to our school profiles. Okay. Perfect. So, Thank you. I'm You're gonna welcome. go. Aaron uh, Peterson. Yes, I wanted to know. Um, so I've been doing this for many years, and I've noticed that the 
lottery system has become more difficult um, than than ever. What I mean by that is usually I'll put down three years in advance, I'll put down at least 10 schools that I know that I would like my child to attend. And I would the wait list number would be maybe like 20 or 30. As the years has gone on, it's now through number 300, number 200. And it's been like that for the last four years. Um, in addition, I noticed even more difficult component where he wasn't matched at all with like five different schools. He did the essay, he did everything for high school and he wasn't matched. It said um, that he didn't get a number or anything. It's like, I can't remember the wording. Um, but I'm I wondering think it's called ineligible, but it's a weird, um, yeah. For, yeah. for selective high schools, I assume, is that yes. what you're referring to? Yeah. So unfortunately, the the kind of process there, you would have to reach out to those individual schools to confirm why he was deemed ineligible. So they the schools themselves are running kind of that um, process between February and March when we then receive the list from them of eligible applicants who are then run through the lottery on our end. Um, and actually, if you get questions about why high school is such an early deadline, why it's different than the pre-K to grade eight, it, that's exactly why is the selective high schools because they have their processes they need to run uh, before we can then get that um, information in return. Um, so yeah, I would definitely reach out to the individual schools around the why um, for that ineligible piece, because unfortunately we don't have that information other than knowing that that's what we received from the schools themselves. Um, okay, okay. so it sounds like um, you guys in particular are more focusing on the numbers, like you have nothing to do with what the high school put in place for how they're going to select their students. Correct. So DCPS, their selective uh, high school rubrics and criteria, that is all, we receive that from them. So we can make sure that uh, parents and families are aware of that criteria, but they are the ones who set that rubric in place and are also at those individual school levels running the auditions and interviews and all of that. That's at the school level that that is happening. That is correct. So how much um, influence do you all have seeing the numbers, seeing how the system works, how much influence do you all have to um, in, in in that process? Like, do they take any suggestions from you all? Do they take surveys? Like, I'm just trying to figure out where's, where's, where's the shift coming from, that's all. A shift, sorry, I want to clarify. Uh, a shift in, in, in what regard? Like, if we're making suggestions for them, are they taking the intricacies, suggestions? Yeah, the intricacies in the process, such as high numbers in the lot in um, having the lottery results, 300, 400. That never, I've never seen that. My son is 13. He's been in DCPS school since he was six. I've never seen numbers that high. Usually when he's on a wait list, he's like number 30 or number 20. That's one of the examples. So that's what I'm saying. Like there's been a shift somewhere. I just can't pinpoint where that's coming from. Yeah. Well, I think in that regard, at least because of those three criteria and like how matches are made, it sounds like, unfortunately, he had a very bad random lottery number is what that sounds like to me. If you're seeing waitlist numbers at that level, um, happy to take a look at the tableau with you to see kind of historically where those waitlist numbers have been. Uh, but unfortunately, because the random lottery number, and it's random, there are some years where if you get a bad number, then you are looking at waitlist positions that are are pretty bad. And it also depends on how many people are applying, how many seats are available for that school at each grade. Um, and then, of course, the preferences that we talked about earlier, if anyone's eligible for those, they would then get a seat before um, anyone who does not qualify for any of those preferences. Um, but there are certainly ways I think in general, we're always about transparency. And so I think we're constantly trying to work with DCPS to ensure at least that the processes are clear and understood by families. Um, Cause I know, I, I don't know if you wanna speak to that, Megan, um, but yeah, it is a, a separate process from us. And then we receive it and run it through the algorithm itself for the lottery. Um, 
simplified. The only thing I'd add is, um, I mean, I hear you. Um, it is something I know when I first came to my school, DC, a statistic that I was interested in is like, well, you know, I, we're, we are very proud of our, this year, a 72% match rate of families that entered the lottery that did get a match to one of the schools that they had selected. But I was asking questions about, well, what about, where does that leave the other, you know, the, that other percentage point uh, of uh, that didn't get any matches and ask some questions around that. And a lot of where that comes from is competition of, you know, certain families are all applying to the same schools. And when they are only, and I think part of the backstory that you don't hear. I don't, I'm not saying this is uh, relevant to your situation, but I do think it's important for people to understand that a lot of the families that aren't getting a match at all are oftentimes ones that are only applying to one or two very select schools that unfortunately are some of our more popular, um, you know, popular schools that receive the most applications. So the competition is going to be higher for that. Now, the point that you're making indicates that, you know, maybe part of the problem is that we don't have enough of those, um, you know, those, those schools that are highly sought after for people um, to be able to apply to. And that is a larger citywide issue. And that's the reason we do, while we don't have direct control over that, because <laughs> we're not the ones opening schools for the city, that are, those are conversations that we bring to our board, you know, in sharing the data about our lottery results so that those that are in positions of power can really understand the full dynamic of what's happening in the city so that they can then weigh those things in their school planning decisions and, and looking at like, where are there places that we might need, um, you know, to be looking at having, I mean, not, I know that was a lot of what with the, with the district just completing its boundary and school assignment study. I know that's a lot of what that group was looking at. If we have a dearth of programs in a particular area, what can we do to remedy that? So I, we, I hear you. I mean, that is part of what goes in to the lottery results. And I do want you to know that that is being looked at critically. And I just, we're gonna come to Anna in just a second, but having been around in this space for a long time, and this has been a conversation for a really, really long time in ways that are absolutely frustrating uh, to many families. And it's unfortunate <laughs> that we haven't kind of cracked this nut in certain ways, because this has been a conversation even before uh, the lottery was the way it is now and even today. I think there are also families who they don't know all the criteria and things that they need to have prepared for their children in order to even be ready for some of the schools because we also have that as a curricula challenge in other spaces. So I do hope that the more that you're able to share your data and where families are finding pain points uh, will continue to be helpful because this has been going on for decades uh, before the lottery after the lottery and will con still continue to go. Um, and we have a lot of schools. Uh, and I know that some of them are good in their own ways and um, different things, but it, you know, as a parent, you you have one shot. Uh, and a lot of parents are trying to shoot their shot, you know, to get their children into the schools that they know will best serve their needs. So I know yeah. just how frustrating it is. Um, but I do want to go to Anna uh, for your question. Hello. Hi. Um, Anna. It's I know that the last person asked several questions, so I don't want to have you go back over. However, um, my thing is more of, like in particular, my daughter, I'm not talking about other kids. In particular, my daughter was told uh, that she would have to select, the school told her she would have to put that school first. Um, and with the application school, she would have to put that school first um, when she did the, the lottery. Um, and that's what they were, all three or four of the application or schools in DC, not gonna name names, all of them said the same thing, put the child as their first pick. However, a lot of times as parents, we pick the, kid, the school for our kids because we want them to go there. But sometimes kids want to possibly look at another school. So for instance, if I pick um, an application school as my first selection, uh, and then the next one I pick like a Jackson Reed or a Coolidge, uh, what happened this year, um, and it's never happened with my other daughter, um, because my other daughter, when she applied for an application school, she had got it and it wasn't her number one spot. And she also had got a couple other schools were on there that had selected her. So like one was DCI for Mandarin, Duke Ellington had picked her. But this year with my daughter, who's 13, going into you know high school, 
the one, the the first selection, of course, I asked her where she wanted to go. She was selected for, of course, she had to be interviewed the whole nine. But she was also looking at another school, but going all the way down, it said, it does, it's not waitlisted. It's not nothing. So if, if the parent didn't put that school first and they might've put it third, does that affect on how the kid is selected? If it had an interview and that school picked them. It does not. Were... Yeah. Okay. So it does not affect how the school selects that student. They don't know how you've ranked the schools. It does affect, like I talked about, um, why ranking is so important because the algorithm assumes you're ranking in the order you like most. So if your uh -huh. student is matched at a one or two, then everything below that will go away. They are not waitlisted because the algorithm assumes that you're ranking how, how you've been instructed in the order you like most. So that's why you're seeing those not waitlisted. Uh, because you ranked them below where you were matched. So even my second choice wasn't even right. If you were, if you got into your first. Uh, yeah, that's choice. what I'm saying. So if you yeah, if you got in your first you choice, get... then you, you, the algorithm did its job. You got your first choice school. Yeah, and so you are not wasted everything about, below that. My thing is more because a lot of times parents want to pick the schools. And I just think of children that um, if there was an opportunity to show that they could have gotten into this other school than the advocacy for the kid to tell the parent well mom I did get into this one but I also got into this non-application school those are questions I have because I'm just thinking about sometimes as parents we make decisions for our kids I'm happy she got into her first pick she chose her school she wanted she got into it but I think about other children um if that's not being selected and only one school is being selected and the rest of them are not waiting to sit and I'm talking about high school um mm -hmm. that it's just a concern I have. That's all. Yeah, that would definitely be like a, a family conversation because you can only have one application uh, and you have to rank that in the order you like most. So that would definitely be like a, a family chat. I do know we have a lot of eighth graders who do their own applications. I do know that. We have some incredible eighth grade counselors um, and programs like Higher Achievement. I saw Elliot Hine mentioned here. I was just at Elliot Hine the other day. They're already talking about next year's high school lottery. Um, so there are programs like that where the students are making their own selections. And I'm sure some parents have feelings about that too, but it does come down to, you know, having those conversations as a family um, and knowing how the algorithm works and that you need to be ranking those schools in the order that you prefer, your kid preferred. I mean, that's, that's a question for each individual family, but yeah, um, that's that, that's the algorithm doing what it's supposed to do. Um, definitely, it's definitely a tough thing. My son is in fourth grade and he was very clear about where he wanted to apply to school and he let me know. And I was surprised. I mean, that's also where I wanted him to apply, but he was looking over my shoulder when I was doing it because he is aware. And so, um, but I also understand my parents were like, listen, this is what we're going to do. There wasn't a lot of conversation. <laughs> so it I also tough. know, and many of us have probably had those experiences. So I think Anna is definitely lifting up um, a really good um, discussion point around, like, you know, I know that uh, maybe a lot of your um, outreach and engagement might be, uh, and, I'm, and I don't want to speak for you, but Chelsea, I'm sure you'll let me know for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly directed towards families, right? More broadly, but are there outreach and engagements that you do maybe with high, like middle school, like going into schools yep. and <laughs> kids about it? And I don't know that because thankfully yep. I'm not in school anymore. Yeah. Um, but she's been in a lot of it. Yeah. Go ahead. Go I know. Well, <laughs> yeah. Higher Achievement. Um, I love Higher Achievement. They're an incredible partner and they're in a lot of, um, middle schools throughout the city. So I've just finished three and I have one more at Kelly Miller. They're having these conversations now in preparing their sixth and seventh graders for that eighth grade year where they'll, where they will be applying to high school. Um, so they've been an incredible partner. Um, we have Kelly Brown is our wonderful school success manager. She works directly with eighth grade counselors. They have, they have their own training um, so that eighth graders throughout the city have a clear understanding of how the lottery works. They work alongside their eighth grade counselors um, on either with, you know, with their parents or with their counselor on those applications as well. Um, and then there are a number of other um, like community partners that do serve middle school youth as well, who we work with. And if I'm ever invited, I'm happy to come talk to, if you have a middle school that you want us to come talk to, um, as long as it's a cross-sector situation, we can be present. Um, but, but yeah, and I, we attend also some high school fairs. We specifically separated out the EdFest actually for the first time ever this past school year to ensure um, that families who were looking at high schools had a, a little bit more targeted 
experience um, and look forward to improving that with our two event model continuing this upcoming year as well. Yeah. Um, but if you, we're always looking for ideas. So if you have other organizations um, or schools that might be interested in getting this information, please let me know. Yeah, I see Tiara. Not, and I was, okay, go ahead, Faith. Yeah, I was like, I see Tiara's here again. But the other thing I want to say is this comes back to um, the selective high school conversation. The earlier you can start talking to young people, because I know my son has also started talking about high school. And I mean, he likes Washington Latin, but he's like, well, if I want to go to this school, somebody told me that I, and he was like somebody, I was like, who is somebody? Who are you talking to? But at any rate, he was like, I've, I heard I need to have algebra by this time, or that I need to have this type of subject. And so there are some spaces where kids are getting that information and where families are getting that information. And there are other spaces where families, unfortunately, are not. So um, we would be happy to help identify other cross-sector opportunities to continue to get that information out because we just equity starts really at the conversation point, not tr just the application. Yeah. Well, if you take a look at the rubric, and again, this can change, and this is DCPS led, but some take into account seventh grade grades. So I had some seventh graders sitting in that room asking, "Why am I here?" And I was like, "Well, uh, because they take into account that final term of your seventh grade year and your eighth grade grade. So like, it is very relevant for these seventh graders as well. So I think definitely ha just having that knowledge um, is key because those grades are the first hurdle to getting an interview or getting seen in person, which I saw I saw um, a parent talking about here as well. Um, did you still have a question? I was coming to you. Did you still have something you want to share? Who me? Yes, I saw your hand up. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, like, you you kind of already mentioned it, but I'm just thinking about like equity. Um, I just noticed that I had moved to Southeast. Certain schools do not pick. I never. I don't know if it's because based off my location. Um, and that's what I was wondering. Like, I thought that the lottery pro process eliminates the location piece. But when I was living in Northeast, he had like three or four choices and his grades were worse. His grades has been better for the last couple of years. And he still did. He only got chosen to one school. So I'm just trying to see like, is the location is also a like a determinant? I, I just, I don't understand what school. I don't understand. So there's only ever one match in the lottery. You, if, you may have gotten offers off your wait list above where you're matched at some point, but you're only ever matched with one school in the lottery. The algorithm will not match you with more than one school. You could receive wait list offers, certainly. It sounds like maybe you've received wait list offers in the past, um, but the algorithm itself will only match you with one school. I think she was saying just the lottery over time. Like she's gotten matches at different times. I don't think she was saying all at once. Oh, okay. But I have also heard this brought up around using, having to up, Having to share your address, where you live, which I know that is information that you need, but I have heard in spaces that people feel like based on their address that they are or not getting um, ranked in certain spaces. And that may not be true, right? But I just want to share too, I have heard this conversation actually over the years where people have said that based on where they live, they feel like they've either gotten a better outcome or not gotten a better outcome. Uh, so she's, so Tiara is not the first person that I've heard mention this previously. So the only reason we ask for the address is because the algorithm takes that into account. If you have an in boundary school, it will let you know what your in boundary school is based on your address. And it will remove that from your options. If you're in K through 12, because you don't need to apply to your in boundary school. Other than that, it has no implication on your results. Okay. Yeah. It's fully okay. randomized. Yeah. And I, it, again, there's a lot of anxiety, right? So, you know, some people, and I, and I hate, um, you know, they're for lack of better terms. I mean, people feel like winners or either like they've lost and, um, there's kind of no in between. Uh, and it's just a lot because as a parent, again, as both of, you know, uh, as all of us know on here, we're trying to do our very best, um, with the information that you have, and we have come a long way. So I just want to say that we have come a really, really long way, but also it's just hard. You know, you put it out there, you say a prayer, you do whatever it is that you do, whatever you believe in, cross everything, you know, do a, a ritual. I don't know, but <laughs> we are trying to put their application out there and just are hoping for the best because it does really feel like your child's future 
is dependent on it, right? Like your family's future. And so there's just a lot of anxiety. And so we do appreciate how far we've come and also this information. Um, I know there's something, a note in the chat from Catrice, I think, um, and also Kasara um, that says, uh, I always put the school, I know my child will get in as a third or second and put the other school uh, that I like above that. So that gives us a better wait list number. I would just say that you should, I will continue to say this over and over again. You should be ranking those schools in the order you like most because how you've ranked them outside of the algorithm trying to match you with the school you like most first, like the number you put it at isn't an indication within the algorithm itself, if that makes sense. So as long as that's how you prefer those schools, if that's actually your order of preference, that's perfect. That's exactly what you should be doing. If that's not, then I would, consider ranking differently in the future just to make sure that you're not then not wait at a school that you prefer more um, which we do occasionally see and if you have to reapply to that school you'll have a, a worse wait list number than you would have had you applied in the lottery itself and Patrice um, has a question in here I'm in a current struggle with one of my scholars matched and the other waitlisted with no guarantee that he will be pulled Thus, I'm placed in the position where I have to turn down the slot because in reality, not accepting uh, both doesn't accommodate my family. I know the availability of actual seats in the school specific, but any ideas on how to mitigate or accommodate scenarios such as this? Um, depending on your current school situation, I would recommend enrolling by the deadline. Otherwise, you'll lose both your seat and the sibling offered um, preference. However, you can of course only be enrolled in one school at a time. So I'm not sure how your current school works because you might then be unenrolled from your current school, which is yeah, an, a really unfortunate position to be in. Um, unfortunately, uh, you mentioned it here, there are varying number uh, of available seats at each grade at each school. So that is outside of our control. It's at the school level. You could certainly call the school and get a sense of kind of that waitlist movement or what they're thinking, but they will go based on their waitlist. Um, if you enroll at the school, um, I think that it's still the same. It would still be that sibling offered. Um, mm -hmm preference so that wouldn't adjust necessarily the, the other waitlist position and I'm not sure of your exact situation or what number you're on that waitlist or historically how that waitlist movement has moved but that is yeah I mean it's a difficult position to be in certainly um I don't know if you have any other no and there was one um mention um I think further up in the comments that I think we can respond to someone had given feedback about attending the high school ed fest event and um having some concerns I think about the crowding uh which we have um a lot um I think Chelsea might want to respond to that because we have definitely um been uh, taking that into account in our planning for next year yeah so uh Full transparency at this point, we are planning to return to Eastern. However, we are planning to return with a whole bunch of changes to the event itself. So a little preview of what's to come um, at CLB later, because I don't think this is secret or not public at this point, but um, we'll be using the front entrance where they already have two established security lines and a central door where we can do the no bag line. So we already are increasing our doors from two to three and making it a clear entrance for families to find versus having to travel around back. Um, we are also going to be utilizing more than just the gymnasium space. So we're planning to put our key education partners, DC Health, immunizations, all that into the cafeteria space when you first come in those doors. And we are only going to have the high schools themselves in that gymnasium, which will allow them to have larger booths, more space for moving around, and then hopefully feel far less crowded because you'll have folks in both the kind of that key education community partner area as well as in the gymnasium and the in-between, the hallways in between that they'll have to travel to get there. Um, so I do think that will help um, a lot with the flow um, as well as with the entrance and everything. Absolutely, because we want to make sure at the very least, I mean, our whole goal of adding that QR code was that families could say, hey, I want more information. And we were hearing that families couldn't even get to the tables to tell schools they wanted more information. So absolutely heard, felt as someone that was navigating that space as well. Um, yeah, so we will be back at Eastern, but hopefully feeling like a much better flow, less overwhelming, 
Um, it was great. We had such amazing turnout. Um, I do think the armory is too big of a space for that turnout. It's, you know, a quarter of the size of the other event. And I think would just not be conducive to the space either. Um, and yes, we are working with nearby church to hopefully get their lot. Unfortunately, the armory itself, which we were hoping to get parking from, um, will likely have the National Guard on site um, during our event, unfortunately. Uh, but we will have expanded parking, hopefully with the church and some other nearby community partners as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a great partnership that I'm hoping to continue with Uber so that folks can get um, severely discounted and or free um, rides to and from as well. So. Yeah, and so I know you had one more section. Um, oh, I, I see this comment by Sharn. Yes, unfortunately that's a cost uh, consideration. Um, and one that I don't think we'll be overcoming, certainly not for next year. So we're going to make these changes at Eastern, see if we're still having similar concerns after this year. And then if I can get an extra, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say anything because it's being recorded, but TBD. Um, I mm -hmm. certainly think we'll consider other venues if the, the changes at this current venue aren't enough to really accommodate the needs um, of this event. But hopefully with these changes, it'll feel like a much um more, more calm and less overwhelming event for our families. But thank you for that suggestion. We definitely have looked in. Um, I know if you have a couple more minutes, if you can go through the events and resources, if you do, I unfortunately have to jump off <clears throat> in one minute. Uh, so James, if you can wrap things up, I have to get on another call, but I want to say in advance of me leaving, just thank you so much for sharing uh, this information with us. As you can see, there's just a lot of feelings and emotions around it. And uh, Chelsea definitely understands as she has children in the system. We see each other at the playground all the time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I know you're thinking about a lot of the same things. So you have, there are really great people working in this space who understand um, the same uh, struggles. So I just wanted to um, publicly acknowledge that and say, thank you so much for this information. And I will let James take it from here and I'll see you soon. Thanks, Faith. Great. Um, fantastic. I don't know if Megan has to hop too. I know we have another meeting um, in a little bit, but I'm happy to walk through um, the events and resources section here. We've already discussed it, but highly recommend um, attending EdFest if you're looking at school options for the following school year. We had a great return to in-person this past year um, with, of course, some growing edges, which we are aware of um, as we prepare for 2024, but we are planning to continue the two event model for um, 2024 and looking forward to that um, hopefully having those dates finalized um, by the end of May so we can start getting the word out earlier um, about, about both of those events. Um, we mentioned this a little bit, but our team other also does grassroots outreach that includes material distribution, tabling, application support, Lottery 101 sessions. Um, so this past school year, we had 145 activations across all eight wards. Um, we have a fabulous list of community partners we work alongside. If you have others you want us to be reaching out to, for me to add to my partner bulletin, um, which makes sure that those partners have the information they need to support their families, please feel free to reach out. I'm always looking for new uh, partners to help us get the word out about the lottery. I mentioned them already, but this is our hotline number. Um, so if you do not have a saved in your phone, definitely do. I know you all are interacting with families on a regular basis. So definitely reach out to the hotline if you have any questions um, when you're supporting families asking questions about the application, or the lottery process, if they need help with their school search or um, any kind of completing applications over the phone, they can reach out to our incredible hotline team. <clears throat> um, if you have not yet, definitely sign up for our alerts. Um, I only get slightly annoying when it comes to deadlines, but I promise to only send you pertinent information. Um, so you can sign up for our alerts, make sure you're not missing any dates or deadlines or events. Um, we have our FAQs and key terms on our site. We also have our school finder, which I mentioned earlier. This is a great tool to find your in-boundary school, but you can also search in a number of other ways. So you can search by the wards you're looking at, the grades you're looking at, and program offerings as well to really help narrow down what schools might be a good fit for you and your family, depending on what you're looking for. 
We talked about the school profiles a little bit earlier when we were mentioning lottery preferences, but our school profiles are a great just snapshot of all our participating schools. So every single school that participates in the lottery has a school profile on our site. Um, it links out to their websites, um, social media accounts. We have a special education contact for every single school that participates in the lottery. You can see a snapshot of park scores and demographics. Um, it links out to the DC school report card and other informational links, in particular like the PCSB <clears throat> profiles, DCPS profiles. Um, it also has a snapshot of the waitlist information, so just like a, a brief overview on that waitlist information. And the lottery preferences like we talked about. You can see the preferences that each school has and the order in which they're applied based on the order in which they're listed on each school profile here as well. Um, Tableau I mentioned earlier as well is a great way for you to see the historic seat and waitlist data. So you can see um, how many seats were made available, um, the matches that were made on results day, and then the waitlist movement between June and October. Um, new this year, you can also see the number of applications that that school applied. So that will only be showing up for the 24-25 school year, but that is a new data point that we've recently added. And then you can also see below that um, on results day how those matches were made by, uh, by preference category. So again, you can see how the schools are offering it and then how those matches are made on results day in case that's of interest as well. I just wanted to add, um, Chelsea, as far as like where you can find that data, she's mentioning Tableau. I mean, that's the uh, the platform that we use to uh, display all of that data, but it's right on, on the top bar of our website. There's uh, one of the tabs is resources. And if you click on resources, data is one of the selections. So you just click on data and it's gonna, the first link that you see on that site is gonna take you to what she's referencing as our Tableau site, where you can look up individual schools and pull up this chart data for each individual school. So yes. it's real, again, I you know. Think, I think the deck, James, correct me if I'm wrong, will probably be going out. I do link out to our data page here from this page as well. Yeah, so it'll be directly really easy the for you guys to find um, from there. Um, we also have a page dedicated to our calendar of events. Right now, it's a little less populous. Um, there are a few open houses now that we're kind of at the tail end here of the lottery cycle, but definitely a resource to check out. Um, you can see on this page, um, you can search by ward and event type to see if any of the schools you're looking at have upcoming events. They also toggle into their school profile. So if you have a school you're looking at, you can actually see if they have any upcoming open houses in their profile as well if you're looking at a specific school. Uh, and then we have this great additional resources page. This includes a fantastic resource that our Parent Advisory Council put together, which is questions for parents by parents. Um, and new this year, uh, questions for students by students, which is actually put together by some eighth graders in higher achievement that put that together. Um, so when you're attending tours um, or talking with administrators or teachers or fellow parents, it's a great kind of baseline for questions you might wanna consider asking when you're going to those. And if this was not enough, we have um, some fabulous uh, informational videos on our YouTube, and these are available in English, Spanish, um, and Maharic, French, Vietnamese, and Chinese. So definitely check those out. Um, if you have any questions just around how the lottery works, it's a great explainer video. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I know I talked fast because we were <laughs> over time here. Um, and I will link uh directly to the data page too so you guys can see the tableau for this upcoming year and i just want to acknowledge i mean i do see a lot more um you know commentary in the chat regarding a feedback on the high school event we you know we are as i said we have taken into account we realized some of the challenges that we encountered with the eastern space last year we are working very hard to address those things but part of this is we are also in a year where budgetary constraints across the city are, are real and so looking at more expensive spaces for this kind of event or additional events is is not really in the cards for us right now. So we're really trying to work with within the resources that we do have and taking the feedback that we've gotten for you about ways to make it the flow better, the cramp, you know, not feeling as cramped. Um, uh, believe me, we are doing everything, we'll be doing everything possible to um, yeah. to address those concerns. And just Catrice as well, I see you mentioned absolutely taking into account families in addition to the high schools themselves. When I say it's a quarter of the size, I mean attendees and uh our exhibitors it, across the board it is a quarter of the size of our other events so I, that space with multiple spaces within eastern should be able to accommodate you know ultimately by the end of the day within those hours we had 1500 so definitely um 
definitely hoping that yeah. we'll accommodate both the exhibitors, but also the families who are coming to join us as well. Um, and I see we have a question. Are you wanting to come off mute? Because are you typing it in? No, I wanted to come off mute. Great. <clears throat> so my question is, so I have five kids and I appreciate it when they had the high schools and the elementary schools and the middle schools all at one fair because it just makes my life easier. Why did they separate it? Um, so we got feedback um, mainly from the parents that were on our Future of Ed Fest working group committee um, that separating out would actually be more beneficial for families. I understand there are some families that kind of are across the board. And so that certainly is challenging having two events. Um, we heard from a lot of families, particularly who are looking at high schools, that their children didn't want to go, that they didn't want to be there. They felt like they were at like a play, um, like a, a preschool event, uh, because you do have you know, a lot of um, the families at that pre-K to grade eight event uh, are some of those younger families. Um, well, not so that, necessarily pre-K to grade eight, but like, because I have, one student that's getting ready to go to high school and one student that's getting ready to go to middle school. So like middle school and high school, I felt should be one event. Yeah. So we were also trying to take into account the number of schools that would have to participate in both events. So that was a, a big deciding factor as well. Um, separating it in the way that we did also separates on the same way our deadlines do. So that was another consideration as well, but certainly heard. Um, and if we, ever regroup, we'll definitely take that into consideration as well. Yeah, thank you for the feedback. Great, I don't see any other questions. I did just wanna um, echo mm -hmm. one more time. I know it's been touched on um, several times throughout the presentation about our availability to come out and do um, trainings to provide application support. I mean, if you know, I mean, Chelsea, you, Chelsea works hard and she is out in the community all the time from, you know, November and she's still out there. As you heard, even post lottery, uh, the lottery uh, results coming out, she is still out doing training. So anyway, if you all know, I mean, I heard you say several times that there, we, we know, we know there are certain families that don't have easy access to this information and may need um, and may need more support and even figuring out where to access some of the information, please, any role that you all can play in connecting us to different groups where we can come out and, you know, we are available to do that. Part of that is, is we need, we need your help, for, you know, from partnering organizations like yours to, to help us identify um, those groups that we can come out because we've got the resources um, and, you know, very willingly, um, and we recognize the importance of that. I fully do. As someone who myself played that role for many years of helping families navigate the process, I get it. It can be overwhelming. And so we want to be that resource. So, um, you know, please stay in communication with us. And if there's any group that you think could benefit um, from this, you know, no matter how big or small, um, you know, let us know. Awesome. Well, thank you all for having us. And thanks, James, and everyone for sticking around a little bit longer. Thank yeah, you so thank much you. for coming. All right. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you all again. Uh, and we'll see you at the next event. Thanks, Bye. everyone.